Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us to this uh, today webinar. Uh, the webinar is going to be about patient engagement leadership. My name is Dr. Dina Ziadlu. I am the moderator for this session. I am a chair of digital transformation leadership at uh, International Society for Telemedicine and Electronic Health. We have a high profile experts today uh, from different countries. We have Dr. Richard Fitton from UK, Dr. Brian McMillan from UK. UK, Dr. Brian Fisher from UK, and Dr. Simo Marsban from the United States. So we, we also have a honored patient guest, uh, Ms. Charles Ch Ashton and Mr. Oliver Cratton. So we are going to talk about the concept of patient engagement because this uh, concept is a comprehensive concept encompassing not only patient health literacy and knowledge improvement in the healthcare landscape, but also engaging patients in decision-making and involving them in their health promotion and disease alleviation. In this webinar, we are aiming to uh, discuss the patient engagement concept from different perspectives of uh, high pro profile experts. Uh, this webinar also features two patients and their perspective uh, about their stories, about their uh, pain and the progress of their disease and the way that they look at the patient engagement concept. Because when we are going to build a patient-centric system, these stories must be intertwined with the medical diagnosis and treatment and must be heard to create accountable decision, effective services, and efficient technologies. So let's start with a brief uh, introduction about the uh, International Society for Telemedicine and Electronic Health. Uh, this uh, organization uh, is in Switzerland, Basel, and it has been existed to facilitate the international dissemination of knowledge and experience in telemedicine and electronic health and to provide access to recognized experts in the field worldwide. So for grasping more insights about uh, uh, this organization, uh, I would invite you to uh, um, um, uh, study the uh, link of this organization, ISFTEH, Org. So uh, it would be great for, for us to join to our group and also learn more about uh, the activities that we have in this organization. So today uh, we uh, start with Dr. Richard Fitton, uh, uh, and he's going to talk about the uh, brief the introduction uh, for the patient engagement leadership. So it is my honor to introduce Dr. Richard Fitton. Uh, he's a in retired general practitioner. In 1968, he assisted Tim D. Dumball, a pioneer in medical IT at the Leeds University Department of Surgery to write alcohol programs. Uh, Dr. Fitton experienced the use of Larsen with as uh, pro problem-oriented records as the basis for the patient medical records. His practice was one of the NHSIA's to electronic record departments and implementation pilots to study patient access records in 2001. He has undertaken research on patients checking their records and care pathways, copying letters to patients and emailing their results to be entered into their own records. Uh, uh, he has been an effective member on National Care Record Development Board and Welcome Trust Consess Working Group. So Dr. Fritten, Please start your uh, um, presentation. Thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation. I would be happy to learn more about your experience in this uh, concept. Thank you very much, Dean. I'll be as quick as possible. I think the patients are probably the most important people. No disrespect to all the other presenters today. Thank you to ISFGH, yourself and to Frederick. And a special thanks to Oliver Crowton and Cheryl Ashton uh, for their generosity of time and also generosity in sharing their personal data and their courage, I feel, in um, actually talking about themselves in the way that they do. Uh, in another context, 
I was we were saying uh, for health information for all that 4.3 billion people in the world have access to a mobile phone. Um, things have certainly moved on a lot. Uh, in the United Nations Secretary General's roadmap on digital cooperation, at the end of June, um, the United Nations group say that we should ensure that all are connected, respected and protected in the digital age. We're certainly some of the way there, but I suppose it'll be a bit like water and food. It will become a time when everybody's connected. But I've always felt that the access to information, people's own information, but is important, but also that actually perhaps the most important creators of health and management of disease are patients and families themselves. Um, the General Medical Council in the United Kingdom, which is a regulatory body of, of doctors in the United Kingdom, uh, published a very useful document, Decision Making and Consent, in November 2020. Um, and it states quite clearly that all patients should be involved in decisions about their care. And also that all patients have the right to be given information in order to make a decision. Um, in the WHO Global Patient Safety Action Plan 2021 to 2030, um, one of the six or seven pillars of the plan is to engage patients and families as partners in safe care. And I'm very pleased to see that and very honoured to be part of this um, discussion today. Uh, they also, uh, a part of the document is to promote transparency to patients, um, including fully informed consent and patient access to medical, to medical records. Um, that's probably the next slide down, Dina, now, if you, could, if you can move down. Um, and, then, and the next one down, I think. Next slide down. Um, and the next slide down after that. Thank you. Next slide down. That's brilliant. Um, the Ombudsman in the United Kingdom, who is uh, the person who deals with complaints. Um, can we go one slide, one slide back? If we go one slide back now, Dina, that would be good. That's it. Um, wrote a report in 2014, which reflects other reports that communication issues or staff attitudes were a factor in almost half of all complaints and poor communication, including quality and accuracy of information was a factor in 35% of all complaints. Well, certainly patients who can access their records have better communication and can also notify the health services of, of, of errors. Next slide, please, um, Dina. Um, finally, from research that we've done, and we've got a lot more, a lot more of these comments. How do patients engage with their care using using records? Here from Cheryl and and Oliver, but these are just a few comments. I've had various tests over the past twelve months and been able to access the results to decide on the next course of action if necessary. I'm able to print off results. I'm able to clarify the situation by reading online reports. I can see if I need to make a doctor's appointment about the results uh, or if, if the results are normal. And I have online access to follow results of tests, letters and x-rays from the consultants, uh, which are sometimes difficult to absorb, but I can understand them in the short consultation time available. That's all I'm going to say, Dina. Thank you again. I'm going to say a little bit later on. I'm really looking forward to hearing from the patients. Thank you. I think you're going to try and get into the um, recording of Oliver, um, Dina. This recording is from a, um, a conference we put on for the public about their records two years ago. We feel that patients should 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 be able to understand how their records are used. That's Oliver there. That's it. I can't hear any sound, I'm afraid. No sound, no sound. No sound there, Dean, coming from it. So perhaps we should move on to, to Cheryl if we can't get any sound from it.
Dina, I don't think Brian and I can hear any sound from, from when Oliver's speaking. I still can't hear what um, what's being said. Specialists, I was very much just watching things happen around me without the understanding that goes with it and without feeling really like I had any input to give. I just went to the appointments when I was told, I listened to what they said, and I did what they told me. Um, once I'd been introduced to the access to my records and I could see blood test results, it just gave me a sense that I was then part of my condition, mm -hmm. I had some information. I had some common information I could discuss with the doctors when I met them, um, and it lifted me out of what I think was quite a difficult time mentally, just to feel that I'd gone from being historically very well, hardly ever visiting a doctor, to very suddenly having a lot of visits, a lot of tests, and it started to make more sense. It started to reassure me. The blood tests would come through, and they were abnormal. I got used to them being abnormal, but I knew from conversation with the doctors which abnormal results just to keep an eye on, and I could contact them and say, I have had this one back, have you seen it yet? Um, and is there something that we should be doing? The real benefit came in the link with the hospital, because I had two lives where I was spending maybe once every three or six months uh, morning at the hospital, but regularly I was going for blood tests at the doctors. And whilst I'm sure the lines of communication between the two exist, I felt that um, it gave me a role in between those to receive my local GP results and I had a direct line to the IBD clinic and the nurses and if I felt that something had gone outside of the limits that they'd been telling me to look for, I could ring them and the speed with which my medication could be changed was effectively over the phone. The, the staff would say, okay, um, you can send those through to us, but based on what you've said, maybe up this medication, maybe try this, maybe we'd like to see you and do our own tests. And I think without, I don't know, I might be wrong, but I think without that kind of um, role for me as well, it would have taken longer possibly to get my condition under control because I'd have been waiting for the natural processes. I don't feel Tested, and I don't feel it generated, in my case, unnecessary um, interactions with the surgery. I think, if anything, it probably reduced the amount of interaction with the surgery because often the results would come through and I could look at them at home in the evening. I could see they were okay. I wasn't chasing the reception of the surgery, saying, have my results come, is there anything to report? Um, and I kind of took ownership for monitoring my condition. And it also meant I felt like I was helping improve myself as well. Um, I wasn't just relying on everybody else to do it for me. So it had a lot of benefits. The other side of it for me is I, I had some side issues they found that required regular injections. Um, the calendar of the surgery, I believe, this is not my area of expertise, so I'm not be wrong. They can only book about seven weeks in advance at the surgery. So when you want to book an appointment, if it's longer than seven weeks away, you have to go away and come back when you're within seven weeks, which is fine, but I don't have a great memory. So 
to have my records, I can check them when I feel I've got time on a monthly basis, and I can think, okay, I had that injection five weeks ago, it's due in seven, the surgery will accept an appointment now, I don't have to rely on them to make contact with me to book that appointment, I can just ring them and say, my last one was then, and within the time period to book, can I get one booked in? And it just feels like it works with far less formal communication, and it's very focused, the communication now has become so it works, they, they expect me to call when I'm ready for an injection, they check that it's, it's ready and they give it to me. So, in my particular case, I am amazed how much difference that access to my records has made. I, I don't think I'd have been where I am now, and I don't think I would feel as in control of my condition now without the ability to see those results. I don't understand them. And I don't particularly think it matters in my case that I don't understand them. I certainly have no medical knowledge. I have no, um, I haven't got the capacity to even start to understand it. But just those few pointers for a doctor to say to me, yes, they're all weird, but just keep your eye on these. And if you feel that it's changed dramatically and you're worried, give us a call and we'll talk you through them. Um, I think it's safe many, many hours of surgery in dealing with me. Um, I don't know if there's anything else I can add. Um, just let me check. I wrote some notes this morning because I'm not used to doing that. Um, let me just check on here. So now, um, You're on mute, Dina. You're not on mute, Dina, but we still can't hear it was, you. It was an insightful oh, there uh, speech from the patients. Okay, thanks. Uh, so uh, let's uh, start uh, and continue with uh, our guest. So let's see. Okay, Miss Ashon. So I would like to invite you to start your presentation. So thank you so much from uh, uh, Mr. Oliver Craton for uh, his insightful report about the patient engagement and his uh, um, 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 uh, actually problem journey and the way that he was uh, looking at the medical records. So Miss um, Ashton, please start your presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, my name's Cheryl. I work for an organisation called Exit UK, and there I'm a, a family support officer, and there we um, help people involved in extremism and the families of individuals involved out of that world. We also educate people on the dangers of extremism. Now, as you can imagine, my job can be quite taxing at times and quite stressful and in order to do it the best I possibly can my health has to come first. Now unfortunately I do suffer from quite a number of medical conditions including Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I had to have a hysterectomy at 37 due to fibroids. They left me ovaries which they removed one two years later. I've had a rectal interception, many prolapses, lots of scar tissue, B12 deficiency and so I'm at the doctors and the, the hospital far more than I'd like to be, to the point that once I went in for surgery and a different surgeon came out and said, oh, hi, hi Cheryl, how are you? Have I got you today? Which was rather embarrassing. Um, in just after I'd had the hysterectomy uh, five years ago, I think it was six years ago now, I was introduced to patient access by a receptionist at the doctor's. To be honest, I think she was sick of hearing from me. I was constantly chasing up appointment, uh, test results, blood test results, um, making appointments. And you'd sit and have a conversation. Can I have an appointment tomorrow? What time? And you'd have to go through all that. And she told me about patient access. And to be honest, I was a little bit nervous at first, but I thought, well, let's give it a go. And it's the best thing that I ever did. It's completely changed my life. Um, 
all the blood test results I get, I don't have to wait now for three days. I, I no longer have to contact the doctor to ask for a call back to explain those results. I get them the same night, generally. And if there's a problem, there's a little red star. And I know then to contact my doctor, I'm not wasting the receptionist time and I'm not wasting the doctor's time. And it's the same with test results. I was constantly on the phone and my test results back because you get anxious about these things and you get worried and you want to know what's going on. Now those results come through on patient access. Anything that I don't quite understand, I can research. And if that's not enough to put my mind at ease, then I can make that call to the doctors and ask for an appointment and ask for them to explain it more. And there's been some really significant times where patient access has been absolutely amazing. And that was two years after my hysterectomy, like I said, the left me ovaries. And unfortunately, one decided to stick to my, the wall and my bowel, my pelvic wall and my bowel, and I had to have it removed. And within a few weeks of that surgery, I, I felt really sick, really poorly. A couple of days later, I went to see the doctor and she sent me for an emergency scan at a mobile scanning unit. The results went over to her and there was a mass and she fast-tracked me as urgent to the hospital um, to have that investigated. When I went to that appointment, when I turned up at the appointment at the hospital, they, they didn't have no record of the scan. They didn't have any information. And I was able to just show my phone and show them the scan results there and then. And um, the paperwork wasn't that relevant. And it actually turned out I had sepsis and I was in there for three days. And Lord knows what, that, what would have happened if they couldn't find the paperwork. Maybe they would have sent me home, who knows. There's been many other times where I've used patient access for um, making appointments again. I'm not wasting time with the receptionist having long conversations about is this time available? Is that time available? I just go on there and have a look at the time and date that's suitable for me. I'm on a number of medications. Again, I'm not constantly phoning the doctors and ordering different. I think I'm on five or six different medications. So I'm ordering at least once a week minimum. I'm not wasting their time. I just go on patient access and I can order. And there's been times when I've been abroad and realizing upon my return, I'm going to run out of certain things. And I've even been able to order abroad while I've been sat there, which was nice, sat in a sun lounger, ordering medication, knowing I'm not going to run out when I, when I come back. I'm not going to be in pain. And it, it's just changed my life. Um, when I go in, I can talk to a consultant and having had the results generally before, when I go and discuss those results, I've been able to research a little bit so I'm not as overwhelmed when I go to that appointment. I've got more of an understanding of what those results mean and what's going on. And I can prepare for the appointment so I can ask all the questions that I want to ask um, instead of leaving that appointment thinking, I should have asked this, I should have asked that. What does that mean? I didn't fully understand it. I can just really prepare myself for when I go. And like I say, having quite a lot of complex issues, that really is very important to me. Um, I just don't, I don't feel like a passenger on my health journey anymore. I feel like I've got so much more control back and I don't feel intimidated by, by my conditions and by going to the hospital. I used to dread it. I used to hate it because I just knew it was going to be overwhelming. I was just terrified of what they was going to tell me. And it, it, it just overall was a shocking experience. But like I say, it's been a life changer. I recommend it to everybody that I know, um, even to uh, clients at work. You know, I, I've, I've had conversations with them and I've said, really consider doing this. It'll make such a difference. And always, within a few weeks of downloading the app, they always come back and say, oh, Cheryl, thank you so much for recommending it. It's been amazing. And the benefits are just fantastic. And no one should ever be concerned that patients can't handle their own med medical records because 
we can. I mean, we, we manage our health conditions, so why not our records as well? It's our lives, you know, and we've got every right to be able to have our say in what happens to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, your thoughtful and heartbreaking uh, story. So, uh, and again, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be our guest and share your story about these uh, challenges that you had uh, during your uh, uh, problem. So, uh, let's uh, continue with Dr. Fitan. He's going to talk about the advertent obstacles put in the way by doctors and health services. Dr. Fitan, please start your presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, and I'd firstly just like to thank Cheryl very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, if she's still there, that was fantastic, Cheryl. Um, I'll, I'll try and do this in about two minutes. Um, but these are just two stories from people. Um, one is a retired colleague who was a GP. And um, I heard from this person a few months ago, how, although when I used to work with this person, they didn't seem to think much about record access. Once they've become a patient and need it, they think it's wonderful. But they said, I am a retired GP. That's a family doctor. When I worked, I rarely bothered my own family practice. I am surprised at how poor access to my medical records is online. And I'm aware I've got Brian Fisher who works with Evergreen Lab. It can be very, very good, but in quite a lot of practice, it's not because doctors haven't been taught yet to promote and to explain record access to patients and neither have patients. I'm disappointed to see that my practice only allows a very basic problem list, some routine blood test results, immunizations, although mine are very inaccurate. And this is one of the things patients really can do as we go forward in the next 10 years around the world is check the accuracy and completeness of the records. Not infrequently, they find somebody else's records have been put in theirs and allergies. All x-rays and scans are entered with the dates to show there's been an x-ray or scan, but they don't show the results. There are no documents and none of the consultations are shown. I feel that access to my complete record would greatly improve the efficiency of general practice. This is her speaking as a retired general practitioner, would be popular with patients and in the long run would reduce work for the practice. If we go on to the next slide, please, Dina, if that's if that's OK. This was um, from another group of patients, um, very, very, very powerfully felt, I have to say, this is a very gentle condens condensation of what, how they felt about it. In fact, we have so many people writing to us with the same scenario. The responses from general practice are very variable. We can get over 100 contacts with people desperately trying to get their health information. It's almost a full-time job at times. We have published the relevant area of the GP contract, because in this country, uh, Dina and Seema, it's part of the GP contract that doctors should share the records with patients. And we have asked people to print uh, uh, the relevant areas out to make an, and to make an appointment with their family practice manager to discuss the contractual requirements of GPs to allow patients access. The results for the patients are generally very positive and we receive thanks for assisting access. I think I could say at this time, Dina, that I personally had quite a lot of correspondence with the United Kingdom General Medical Council trying to encourage them to have educational uh, requirements for medical students and doctors about promoting and dealing with patients access in their records. I think it's, it's seriously lacking. Our view is that there's a lack of information and training for practice staff and in some cases cultural opposition. Thank you very much. That's, I, I'm finished. Thank you very much Dr. Shethan. That was great. Uh, so uh, let me uh, introduce uh, uh, another speaker that we have. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Stima Marsban. Uh, she is Vice President for Research and Academic Affairs at Larkin University and Health System in Florida. She's a uh, medical doctor, MPH, PhD, uh, and a faculty of uh, postgraduate academic uh, department since 2005. She has conducted over 
1,100 research projects and dissertations during her academic and executive roles. Dr. Sima holds faculty appointments at Larkin and Geeling School of Global Public Health, University of North Carolina. She started up the KPI Key Patient Insight Company in 2020 based on a belief in the value of analytics and decisions results from a thought understanding of non-medical variables of the care that influence patients' daily life, including emotional, informational, behavioral, financial, decision processes, family relations, and quality of life over the care journey. So Dr. Marzvan, please start your presentation. Hello everyone, this is my pleasure to be here today and I'm so excited about having the voice of patients here and I learned a lot from Dr. Fitton's presentation. So excited to have all of these pieces of the puzzle, pieces of the patient engagement puzzle. So um, I really appreciate uh, Dr. Dina's effort and all panelists to have this webinar by the International Society for Telemedicine and eHealth with participants from different countries. So I appreciate also the participants at this webinar. I would like to share a multi-stakeholder model to lead patient engagement in the healthcare industry. The model is the outcome of a scoping review study has been done in 2020, which is published in a Springer. So you have uh, access online to uh, a chapter of book about patient engagement, leadership and role of technology in it. I try to share a very summary of what the model is designed for. Before presenting the model, let me discuss the meaning of patient engagement to be on the same page. Is it the same as patient education? Is it just providing access of patients to their medical reports or clinical profile, electronic health record or something like that? Is it patient empowerment or is it patient satisfaction or patient experience? If I ask you, it is the same as which mentioned concepts, how do you respond? To your knowledge, a well-educated patient to consume the medications on time and compliant with care protocol is an engaged patient? Or a patient who carefully listens to the physicians is an engaged one? Or a patient who have fully access to medical reports online is an engaged patient? I should say patients are engaged when they are actively involved in their care. And I really appreciate a cherry voice here and the Oliver case and a story here that reflected this need, addressed this need, that patients need to have active involvement with their scenarios, with their care planning. Because when we can, value, empower, and listen active to them, and provide an interactive dialogue, and provide the opportunity to make shared decisions, then we document it, as Dr. Fitton uh, brought to this webinar that he has documented the voice of patients, their experience, and the points that can help us to improve their experience for the future generation, for the future care services, then providing opportunities to apply their ideas in their personal care as much as in systems improvement. We can say that our context and our organization uh, pay enough and adequate attention to patient engagement. So patient engagement associates with informed, heard, empowered, and actively engaged and involved patients. Please, next slide, Dina.
If you search the patient engagement term, you see many fans, companies, policy makers, insurance corporations, pharmaceuticals, and more than all of them, digital software developers that all talk about patient engagement and show patient engagement as an imperative part of their strategies. We have studied truthfully how different stakeholders look at this scheme of patient engagement. And the results was really interesting because, because the fact was there are many, many understanding, diverse understanding of patient engagement and approaches were heterogeneous and patchy. We found that patient engagement strategies uh, are not always consistent with patients' values and benefits or expectations, as we expect from the term. From the term, we expect that the patients are in the center of the focus. But um, that was not the thing that we found from um, review of evidence, review of websites, review of companies, review of healthcare delivery systems and the data platforms, patient portals. That was something different that we found that they are trying to do some efforts and attempts uh, in the sake of engaging patients, but there are many things and many gaps in this scenario, in this uh, concept review that uh, I, I can show you here that the understanding of, for example, pharmaceutical companies is providing access to clinical trial subjects or maximizing the retention adherence or uh, from the lens of payers, it's avoiding extreme costs. From the lens of hospitals, it's um, keeping patients connected and uh, maximizing adherence and uh, bringing new patients from the health information technology groups and um, data platform developers. It's connecting to new and existing customers because it's a tool for marketing. It seems that public health professionals have a bigger picture of patient engagement by having informed care than empowered patients. Thank you, Dr. Dina. Can you please go to next? We combine the stakeholders' perspectives and develop a conceptual framework that is advisable to patient engagement people and experts and professionals. Uh, considering all actors in this complex, in the leadership of the patient engagement, the model highlights key actors and interactions that influence patient engagement. Fundamental point is leading patient engagement occurs in a complex system. It's a complex system. It's not a simple interaction between doctor and patient. It's not a simple um, ecosystem with only doctors and patients and how to communicate with each other. But also we have key actors who are payer organizations, and their policies and regulations, provider organizations and their policies and regulations at, as Dr. Fitton explained well that the doctors should be trained in this way and should learn about that, the value of patients' experiential knowledge and the value of patients' voice. And also uh, in an invisible layer, pharma and other supplier are also playing their role in this situation. So this is important to consider all of these medical providers, payer organizations, patients, patient portals and technology developers and provider organizations. All of these stakeholders are important. Their interaction is important and the data that, uh, that is passed on between them, their interaction is very important, the policies and regulation to provide better health outcomes for patients and having patients engaged. The next slide, please. As we reviewed, the first component of the patient engagement are activated and engaged patients. Engaged patients are the people who build the knowledge 
build the knowledge and confidence to ask and to talk as Cheryl explained us, shared her experience well with us. We need to empower patients to ask them to be active in the process. So build the knowledge and accept accountability and control over the care, control over the care, not just listening. They are informed, they should be confident and quality demanding patients, ask askers who talk with confidence and ask and express their needs and expectations, those patients are better partners in this model. It's important to pay attention to personal and family factors that you see in the left side, personal and family factors that affect the capacity of patients to be engaged with their healthcare and to improve the processes, to suggest something to us, to apply for improvement of our systems. Please, next slide. The powerful influencer is insurer because it's where the money is. The upstream policies to keep patients engaged should, should come from insurers and employers. To maximize patient engagement, payers play a fundamental role since payment mechanism shape the behaviors among physicians and providers. For example, in current policies in the United States, higher compensation for annual wellness visits, annual wellness visits, has made it attractive and essential to physicians or saved shared amount by uh, CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid is motivating accountable care organizations to plan for quality saving. Those are samples, examples of policies that motivated and uh, uh, made incentives for physicians to, uh, to center on patient engagement and to excel role of patients in improving quality and to, um, to close the gaps in payments. Please, next slide. The other impacting player is physician and clinical team. We amplified in this model that physicians' efforts for patient engagement are a function of how they are trained. As Dr. Fitton mentioned it, discussed it, it's very important how we can train the physicians in educational context and how they are supervised by their medical organizations and how they are paid by insurers. However, individual factors in the left side of the slide, individual factors like personal traits and decision style influence their communication and interaction uh, and the quality of their interaction and communication with patients. But um, there are uh, many personal factor and organizational factors that influence their interaction with patients. Next slide, please. As much as payers are important, the organizational systems that manage the dependent physicians are important. Here in the United States, we have dependent physicians and independent physicians. So dependent physicians should work under regulation of their payers, should work under the regulation of their organizations. Imagine a hospital or accountable care organization that promotes PE as a strategic priority and has a leadership guide for patient engagement and patient family advocacy programs to improve the care. Compare it with other delivery networks that understand PE only as reminding daily reminders for unnecessary schedules and procedures. That's important to distinguish and to have a, to prioritize how to approach patient engagement through a provider organization perspective. Next slide, please. According to the model IT platforms that claim patient engagement as an essential advantage should cover first the patient needs. We found that IT platforms as patient portals are more concerned about providers and insurers more than 
uh, more than patients, but we should have patients and the center of their efforts. And they should meet main user expectation. What are the main expectations of the patients? I think they need easy, understandable, and usable and well illustrated and real time information to decide and active involvement with their care planning. So those are important to provide in the patient portals and changing the paternalistic way of engagement to a flat communication and flat partnership. Next slide, please. So- You have a minute uh, yeah. left. Okay, that, and this is the last slide, Dina. Thank you for your patience and all people who are listening to me. So the conclusion is the patient engagement is a dynamic and evolutionary process that requires multi-stakeholder interaction. This is not only doctors and patients. This is not only access to medical reports or online access to people to provide billing a statement for that because many of portals right now provide billing a statement um, at the same time, uh, the signs and symptoms and medical reports. So this is a very integrative and a very interactive and dynamic model for leadership. And the proposed systems-based model enables healthcare professionals to systemic systematically lead and develop patient engagement. Thank you all for listening and your uh, attention to my presentation. Thank you, Dina, for providing this opportunity. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you so much for a remarkable presentation. So as we are uh, run of the time, so uh, I, uh, it's my honor to uh, introduce uh, another speaker that we have, Dr. Brian Fisher. He's a chair of Health Creation Alliance at, uh, in UK and director of Evergreen Life uh, organization. Uh, Dr. Brian is an honorary researcher at both King's and Guy's primary care department in the medical school and the Imperial Medical School in the primary care and public health department. He, he has published many peer-reviewed papers on community development and uh, on people having online access to their GP records. Uh, he has successful in getting the Department of Health funding for the groundbreaking health empowerment leverage project, uh, which developed a business case for community development in health. Uh, he has awarded an MBE for community development in 2007 and He's a champion of patient record access, and now he's a director of a company called Evergreen. Dr. Brian, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Please start your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm also a, a semi-retired GP. Can I have the next slide, please? These are going to move on quite rapidly. So this is what I, I want to discuss. Um, we've heard brilliant presentations from Cheryl and from Dr. Marsban and Richard. Um, and I'm, what I'm going to try and do is to take us beyond record access. So um, Dr. Marsban has given us a very big picture and I'd like to build on that by giving practical examples based on the experience in, through Evergreen Life. So I'm going to look at record access now with practical examples and then to think about how record access can become the infrastructure for the sort of thing that Dr. Marsban has been talking about. So it's one element, one important element uh, for shared decision making and for a sort of bridge between the patient and the provider. So next slide, please. So Evergreen Life is a software company um, based in the UK. Um, we have 850,000 uh, users rising by about 1,000 a week. We're assured by the NHS offering record access that uh, Cheryl has described, booking appointments, ordering prescriptions online. Uh, we also offer a personal health record and you'll see an example of that where people can put their own data into into the app. 
uh, we're involved with research uh, using harnessing the data that people are telling us about um, to, to improve uh, research across the country, across the globe. Um, and we also offer the ability for people to um, get data from their DNA. Um, as, as we, we charge them for that. And of course, this is in the NHS. So in contrast to Dr. Marsban, um, the NHS is free at the point of use. So the whole paying element is quite different. So this is a free service um, to people across the UK. And the idea of Evergreen Life is to place as much control as possible into the hands of people and to keep us as fit and well as possible. Next slide, please. So when you go into the app, this is what you see. The figure 72 is your wellness score and it enables you to get some idea of uh, to what extent you've done what you can to look after yourself. We're particularly interested in food, happiness, fitness, um, the, the GP area is where you can look at your GP records and the records section at the top is where you can look into your own personal health record and put in your own data. Next slide, please. So this is, these are practical examples about how the sorts of things that are possible now and also what might be possible in the future. So you can view your medical record, book appointments, order medicines that your doctor has prescribed. Next slide. Um, it enables you, it reminds you to take your medication, so it helps um, compliance. Next slide. And this is the personal health record, so you can add your own data and it uh, graphs it as you, as you add the new data so that you can keep up um, and see what's happening to your own health information. Next slide, please. And very importantly, you can add information that only you know. For instance, you might have bought medications across the counter. Um, and so in this way, if, you, if you're adding to the record, you build up a record that is actually more accurate than your GP record. Next, please. And also you can share this information with other people. So you can share it with your family, um, you can share it with clinicians, um, anyone else that, that you want to share it with. Next, please. And you can put important documents into the app. So for instance, your COVID vaccinations um, or other documents that you have that are not in the record. So again, that builds up your own ability to have an accurate record. Next, please. So that's a kind of quick snapshot of what in practical terms, um, this version of uh, record access can offer us. Um, and there are elements that we, that Evergreen Life offers that helps us to stay well. So building on that. So if I could have the next slide, please. Um, so as part of the wellness score, we offer questions, questionnaires, um, and give people information um, across these four areas, health records, fitness, happiness, and food. And the aim is to help people understand what they can do to stay as well as possible. So next slide. Here's an example of a questionnaire. Um, it's a subjective happiness check. It's a standardized questionnaire that's been agreed uh, across the world. Uh, next, please. And you get a progress report depending on what you've said. You can see that I was feeling particularly bad at that time. So, uh, but anyway, it keeps, it keeps track on how, on how things are going for you. Next, please. And depending on how you fill in the questionnaire, you get a, a moderately personalized feedback. So this is advice about how you can feel happier. Um, again, evidence-based, all with references so that you can actually start making changes yourself uh, to feel uh, to improve your health, in this case, to improve your happiness. Next, please. So that's the sort of things that we have been doing um, as a way of supporting people who are otherwise well to stay well. 
But we are now thinking, and we may be doing work with, well, we are doing work with Brian McMillan on this, um, that we want to do the same kind of process for people with long-term conditions. So these are conditions that can't be cured, but can be managed. Conditions like high blood pressure or heart disease or asthma. Um, and we think that there is a huge opportunity to help people with those conditions to stay as fit and well as possible. And we know, particularly in the UK, that people are not very good at doing that. It's, it's not easy to do, for sure. Um, but the evidence suggests that apps like this can make a very big difference to people's health behaviours. And uh, we're hoping that this will make a difference to people with long-term conditions. So I want to just explore that with you very briefly, and I would be happy to get ideas and, and feedback from people about how this might be possible. Next slide, please. So because we have access to the record, we can actually personalise feedback to people quite precisely. So we know what your cholesterol is, we know what your peak flow might be, or your the medication that you're on. And so we might be able, um, harnessing that data to give people very precise and personalized feedback about what they can do to make a difference to their cholesterol or their peak flow. Next, please. And of course, they can choose their own way of doing this. And then the next aspect of this is that we know also that telling people what to do or giving them advice about what the right thing to do is doesn't work. So people don't change their behavior just because you tell them uh, what they should do. But there is evidence that if you involve techniques that have been used for games, um, that you probably can make quite a big difference to people's behavior, that we'd be focusing not just on their academic or their intellectual approach, but with their hearts as well. Next, next. And we could reward them to make a difference to their, um, to their health. So we also want people to, as, as Dr. Marsban has said, to take as much control as possible. Two examples of how that might be done. So we might be able to show people what good clinical practice looks like for good diabetic control, for instance. Um, and so if they're not getting that kind of care, they could be taking more control with their clinicians to make a difference. We know also that it's not just about our own behaviors. It's also about the social, social circumstances in which we find ourselves. So it may also be possible to enable people to contact their local government if they want things changed, to help with debt relief, to help with local housing. There are a whole range of things that it's possible to do because we know their postcode we know what their local services are, and we can help them take more control over their lives as well as their health. Next, please. You just have one minute left. Yep. So we also have access to their DNA if they've bought that, and um, that can also help them, for instance, choose the right kind of exercise um, that would make a difference to their health. Next, please. And again. So what we're after is helping people to take more control over their health and their health care using their own data and their own ideas. That's the next step, we think, that will really make a difference to um, the way people look after themselves and their health with long term conditions. Thank you very much. Next slide. That's the end. There you go. Perfect. Thank you so much for presenting this well-established platform. So uh, let's uh, continue with Dr. Brian McMillan. Uh, he's a National Institute of Health Research Advanced Fellow at the Center for Primary Care and Health Services Research, University of Manchester. He's also a practicing GP and a registered health psycho uh, psychologist. He completed uh, his PhD at the University of Leeds and worked there as a research fellow before returning to a student life to study medicine. Uh, he completed his academic foundation training in York, was a NIHR academic clinical fellow in Sheffield during his GP training and then moved to Manchester to take up a post as a uh, NIHR clinical lecturer in primary care. 
Brian, Dr. Brian is a member of the Royal College of General Practitioners and a charter psychologist and associate fellow of British Psychological Society. Dr. Brian McMillan, please start your presentation and thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be an speaker in this webinar. Thank you very much for in inviting me, Dina. Um, just, I'll just set a little timer on my end. So how long have I got? Uh, you have uh, six minutes. Six minutes, okay. Um, so I found the previous talks fascinating. Uh, it's gonna be a hard act to follow. Um, I'm probably not gonna go into quite as much detail. I'll just give a bit of a brief overview. Uh, so, this is a quote from De La Signan et al, who conducted a systematic review of patients' records access back in 2014. And he highlighted that there's a need for more research to work out how the medical record could be redesigned to, to teach patients, to guide them in, in a way that promotes them to look after their own health better and ultimately to improve their health. And I think that's one important aspect of online records access, but there's obviously lots of other important reasons why we should be doing research into it as well, uh, such as you know, increasing patient uh, empowerment, uh, patient activation, um, saving the NHS money. Uh, so you know, a whole host of reasons. So next slide, please. Um, and we already know from the previous presentations and the research that's been done to date that there are multiple benefits to online health records access for both patients and clinicians. Um, there's good evidence that it increases patient autonomy, trust, safety, so patients notice drug errors in their record, for example, get these flagged up. Um, there, there's evidence that it can make the the health service more efficient. So I think uh, Cheryl mentioned about how she doesn't have to keep ringing the surgery up to ask about things that she can just access now herself and her record. And there's been a systematic review, well, there've been quite a few systematic reviews. One published quite recently at the end of last year uh, by Anna Neves in uh, BMJ Quality and Safety. And that, I'd recommend having a look at that paper. Uh, it's uh, open access. and. One of the things that showed that, as well as all of these other benefits, there is some evidence that it, it can have benefits on clinical outcomes, such as people's blood glucose levels and, and sort of more mixed picture for things like blood pressure as well. I've done a bit of research speaking to patients and carers about what they want from being able to access their record. And we had that published uh, just this year in BMJ Open, if anybody wants to have a look. Um, the, the kind of things that patients say they would like to be able to do is they would like the record to be more interactive. And uh, Dr. Fisher has just you know, given an excellent, some excellent examples of how Evergreen Life are making the patient record more interactive for patients. So in the early days, it was very much you could access a lot of factual information that may not really have meant very much to someone that didn't have clinical training. But it's now becoming more uh, patient friendly, more user friendly, more sort of easy to understand from a lay person's perspective, and it is becoming more interactive. Um, it's worth mentioning, I don't know how many people here are from the UK. Um, in the UK, there are quite a lot of different platforms now that provide patients with access to their records. So the last time I looked, it was sort of in the 20s, um, you know, different different platforms. Uh, one of them is Evergreen Life, which Dr. Fisher's presented. Uh, there are others such as the NHS app um, and some of the other patient records providers that provide the records to GPs also provide online access. Um, and I mean, that, that, that's good. People have got a lot of choice, but I'm going to sort of mention in a, in a, a minute just how that seems to be making things a bit more complicated in some ways as well. Um, so yeah, other things that patients want is they want to be able to understand what's in the record to have more plain English explanations. So for example, um, one of the patients was talking about how he was able to access the blood test results, but didn't really understand a lot of the information that was in there. So patients would like to be able to click on aspects of results, for example, and see uh, maybe a little video explanation telling you what, what a particular part of, of your results mean. Um, other things, uh, I don't know what it's like in um, 
other countries, but certainly in the UK, uh, the records aren't very well linked up between primary care and secondary care and other tertiary care. Uh, and again, that's due to lots of different platforms being used within general practice. There's about four main platforms and in hospitals, there's a whole range of platforms and they don't always talk to each other as well as they should. Although there has been some progress made in this as well. Um, oh, sorry, you moved me on. Um, so what don't we know? Uh, so I think I, I've downloaded four different apps to, to just to do a little experiment. So I've requested access from my GP, but all of those apps show me slightly different information. Sometimes I can see my results going back a month. Sometimes I can see it going back to the beginning of when I first requested access, but there is a lot of variability. Uh, so I think we need to figure out why that is the case. Uh, we need to figure out how to best present more complicated information, how to make the, the record even more interactive, um, the kind of things that patients would like to be able to put in the record, what clinicians think about patients being able to write in the record and the kind of things they want to be able to get out of that because they don't want to be deluged with uh, an avalanche of, of data from patients. Um, who should we be able to give control? Uh, you know, so would it be right if patients could stop certain clinicians from seeing parts of the record or does that open up a whole range of you know, risk to clinicians? Uh, and one of the most important things I think is we need to do more research into looking at the potential impact on health outcomes of improvements to uh, health records access. Um, and I think one of the problems with that is that health records access is essentially an incredibly complex intervention. There's so many different components to it. Uh, and the only way really to the gold standard way of knowing which of those components is the one that's making the difference is to look at them in isolation. But obviously this is not always possible. Uh, so next slide, please. I'm aware I'm running, running out of time or if I haven't already. Um, so the kind of things I would like to see is I'd like to see some representative surveys of who can see what in, in terms of patient records access. It's actually incredibly difficult to find that information out. So NHS Digital in the UK have got some very limited information on, on who can see which bits of their record. But I think we need to do more work on that. And we need to work you know, with patients, carers, healthcare providers, software providers, developers, policymakers to look at developing improvements alongside patients, listening to what they would like to see, prototype these improvements, test how feasible it is to actually roll them out in the real world, and then run trials to see, do these improvements actually improve health outcomes and improve patients' experiences of healthcare? And that's something that uh, myself and Dr. Fisher are hoping to work on uh, in the coming months. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, your speech. I'm so sorry because we are uh, running out of time. So uh, we have uh, a question from one of the participants. Let me see. Uh, uh, one of the questions that we have here is about how can health setting work better with community and social services organizations to extend the support that patients get for their health uh, condition beyond the doors of the health clinics? Uh, if one of, Sorry, could you repeat the question? The yeah, the, the question is about the uh, way that uh, health settings work uh, better with community and social service organizations to extend the support that patients get for their health condition beyond the doors of the health clinics. Uh, we have the, this question in a uh, Q&A question and answer box. Uh, Dr. Fitton, if you want to review the question, it is a... Um, one paragraph explanation. I am just uh, maximizing the question here. I could say something about this if you want. Yes, please. Yes, go ahead. Yes. So, um, first of all, I think people should have access to their social care records. Um, I, again, I don't know how it happens in other countries, um, but um, on the whole, that doesn't happen in the UK at all, I think, but it should. And we also ought to have access to our dental records and probably to our welfare benefits records. So the, the, the Department of Work and Pensions uh, organizes their, that. Um, so 
we, we should be having access to all of those. They're our records, it's our information, we should have access to them. But there are many other things I think that we could do to involve people more in their local community. So I've suggested, for instance, that people could automatically uh, be put in touch with their counselor. They could be not, the, not their mental health counselor, but their local government uh, representative. Um, you could also um, help people with debt relief uh, to challenge their housing problems. And also there are um, loads and loads of, um, in, in the UK in any way, voluntary agencies, the sort of agency that Cheryl actually spends most of her time doing work in. Um, and it's possible to link people up with those too. So we know uh, we've, we've more or less finished a, a process by which um, because we know with people's postcode, we can actually give them a list of local voluntary organizations in their area and the ability for them, for people to contact them themselves. So I think there are quite a lot of things that could be done that are nothing to do with the NHS, but are very much to do with people's health. Okay, perfect. Uh, we have the last question here. How can we engage patients in developing countries while there are not fundamentals? I want to contribute to the reply of the last question. We discussed how we can uh, involve patients through patient portals. If patient portal developers pay attention to the needs of uh, patients first. So one of their uh, needs is access to additional resources for social support, for financial support, for medical information and facilitating the journey after hospital, after hospitalization, after vi the, the visits and after diagnosis. So that's important to continue the care integratively after um, discharge from hospital with the patient portals to provide their uh, communication and keeping them connected and uh, having their uh, needs let the, the portals that uh, provide the opportunity and links for patients to let us know what is their expectation, what's their uh, essential need, and what are their needs to have the support is very important in patient portal and technology development for patient engagement. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for a thoughtful answer. So, um, uh... So I'm getting some uh, requests for the PowerPoint, so please uh, uh, feel free to contact me so I can share the PDF, PDF of this uh, presentation to you guys. So I just share my email address here for you. Uh, you also can have access to the record of this webinar through our uh, uh, International Society for Telemedicine and Electronic Health website in the education part. So you can see the uh, upcoming events and past events. So in the past event, you can see the re uh, record of this webinar. Thank you so much a lot for uh, uh, being our guest today. I learned a lot from all of you. Thanks so much. Uh, so it was a, a fruitful meeting for me and uh, I hope all participants had uh, great takeaways from this uh, meeting. Thank you, Dr. Fitton, Dr. Fisher, Dr. Marsbond, Dr. McMillan and Ms. Ashton. Thanks so much. Have a great- Thank you, Dr. Dina. Thank, sure. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for providing. Thank you. Of course. Thank My you very pleasure. much, Dana. Bye -bye. Thank sure. you very Thanks. much. Bye -bye. Our pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very Bye. much. Bye.